What's going on, Packer fans? Happy Saturday. Welcome into the Pack-A-Day podcast. Hope you enjoyed your Victory Friday. My name is Andy Herman. Thank you so much for joining me. We had some interesting news uh, from Friday, some good news, some bad news, some very bad news. We had a press conference from Matt LaFleur. I think I'm going to keep this short and sweet today, so let's jump into those topics right away. And I'm kind of going to go in chronological order a bit here. The first thing we found out was Kylan Hill and that he is officially out for the year with a torn ACL, which is brutal. It's 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 very brutal. And I know he's not a core member of this offense right now. You could tell in multiple press conferences how excited Matt LaFleur was about Kylan Hill and about wanting to get him on the field. You could see there were like it is it is rare that I mean look at AJ Dillon last year. I just want to compare the two, right? Last year, Green Bay had Jamal Williams and they had Aaron Jones. And for the most part, Green Bay didn't really get A.J. Dillon going until later in the season. Uh, they had some injuries. They had some COVID stuff, so on and so forth, including A.J. Dillon. But they didn't look for like specific packages to get A.J. Dillon in. They are looking. They were looking for ways in screen passes and some of the different unique things that they were doing with Pony Pack. They were looking for ways to get Kylan Hill on the field. They he I can't tell you enough how amazing he looked in training camp. You saw a glimpse of it in preseason. We saw a glimpse of it as a kick returner. Yes, he didn't have a major role within this offense, but you never want to see a young, promising player have a torn ACL like that. We've seen plenty of players return from ACL injuries. Uh, it's not you know necessarily the death sentence that it once was uh, for players, but you just don't want to see that, especially for young, promising players, especially for Kylan, who so much of his game is the ability to cut on a dime and make people miss. You know that that's going to take some time for him to gain confidence in that again and to run the way that he was. So a devastating injury on a kick return, and you just wish he just would have taken the knee or let that ball bounce in the end zone rather than take something out. That's what you love about Kellen Hill. I I know that it was a poor decision and, and something he probably shouldn't have done regardless, but he has that fire, he has that competitive will, and we've seen that from players in the past. Sometimes it can get you into trouble, but overall, that's usually a positive trait to have. I'm bummed incredibly uh, about the injury. I'm hoping he can bounce back fast and and we'll see just how quickly he can return from it. Likely be a situation potentially where he could end up on the pup list again. We'll see if he can work his way back quickly enough to be potentially part of training camp, but that would be a really tight turnaround. So likely a a pup list candidate for next year. So just disappointing. To be fair, Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon are going to be on this team again next year. And then you start getting into decisions with Aaron Jones the following year. So if Jones and Dylan are still the two next year, you're looking at 2023 is when you really would hope that Kylan Hill is ready to go and probably take Aaron Jones spot and tag team with AJ Dylan at that point. So plenty of time to recover before then, but it's just devastating to see. And certainly a player who provided a ton of depth and we'll get to potential replacements in just a moment. And then, of course, we get the news that Robert Tunyon, as feared, also tore his ACL, two ACLs on one day. Again, absolutely brutal. And, you know, as far as, you know, replacements for Tunyon, we'll get into that in just a moment. But you could tell how devastated Matt LaFleur was from this as well. And he mentioned the other day just how much growth that Tunyon has made since his time coming to Green Bay. And you could see it, right? I've mentioned to you numerous times. I first saw Tunyon on a, a seam route in the, the first practice uh, in in 2018. And it was Jimmy Graham and Mercedes Lewis first day with the team open to the public. And, you know, I'm watching the tight ends and, and Tunyon catches my eye and he's kind of been on my radar ever since then. And But it's one thing to have one flash play in practice, and then it's another to learn how to block and protect and uh, become the tight end that he's become. I know he hasn't had the season that I think a lot of people were expecting or hoping for, but still a key member of this Packers offense who they will now be without for the remainder of the year. So how do you replace these two players first and foremost? Let's start with Kylan Hill. Patrick Taylor, the only running back on the practice squad. So I think it's... Fairly decent assumption that he will get activated to the active roster and then they'll likely add a new running back to the practice squad. It's possible that they could poach somebody from a practice squad somewhere. One player that I would love to see would be Javian Hawkins from the Rams, who has some familiarity with that Sean McVay offense. Very, uh, you know, uh, fast and, um, you know, not not that dissimilar from a Kylan Hill. Uh, he's a unique running back and catch the ball out of the backfield a little bit as well. Uh, moved his way around uh, different rosters this, this past offseason as an undrafted free agent, uh, but has stuck with the Rams as an undrafted uh, pick and on their practice squad now. 
That would be a player I'd be interested in. Jaquan Hardy, another undrafted free agent on the Dallas Cowboys would be intriguing as well. There's a couple guys out there, but uh, the pickings aren't very great at the moment, even looking at practice squads or guys on the street. So Green Bay is going to have to get creative. They've found ways to find running backs in the past, and I would expect them to be able to do that again. But I think Patrick Taylor could easily be uh, somebody that you see called up. I, I liked Taylor uh, up until really we saw him in games. I didn't think he ran well in games. I thought in practices he ran really well, uh, but he's deserving of an opportunity. And if he does get that opportunity, I'd be excited to see what he can do. And then again, they'll have to add somebody you would think as another running back to the practice squad, just to add some depth in that running back room in the building. So we'll see what happens there. As far as kick returner for Kylan Hill, I would expect Malik Taylor to get the first shot at that. You know, maybe Amari Rogers gets some opportunities. Uh, interestingly enough, Patrick Taylor could be somebody that returns some kicks as well. So we'll see what they do there. Uh, but uh, a, a loss nonetheless for Kylan Hill, and they're going to have to probably get a little bit creative with how they replace him as both a number three runner as well as a kick returner. Robert Tunyon, I think for the time being, is, is more straightforward. Uh, I think they still have four tight ends on the roster. Mercedes Lewis, Josiah DeGuara, Dominique Daphne, a little bit H-back tight end-ish, and then Tyler Davis, who I think some people forget about. Tyler Davis actually has a couple interesting, intriguing snaps on tape. Uh, big time hustle guy. There's one play, I think he's had like five snaps on tape, but one of them, uh, he's blocking all the way on this side and there's a run to the right and he's sprinting over to the right side of the field to go and, and find somebody to block and just things like that you love to see. So you know, kind of intriguing number four tight end, has some skills as a pass catcher. We'll see, but I think this is going to primarily be Mercedes Lewis and Josiah DeGuara time with Dominique Daphne getting more time as an H-back slash fullback. Uh, Daphne played well this past week. I also think Daphne can be used in a tight end role. So I, I think they're going to have to be a bit more creative. I don't think they have a, a Robert Tunyon on the roster. Uh, they do still have Bronson Kafusi on the practice squad as well. So there's definitely some options. I don't think they need to replace that. I think they, with the four tight ends that they have, I think that's plenty. You don't need, I know they just had five tight ends active on game day, but it's not certainly a necessity. And, uh, you know, Mercedes Lewis has his role ingrained in this in this team. And then you're going to look at probably DeGuara probably taking the majority of uh, of Tunyon's snaps. I thought uh, DeGuara looked pretty decent this past game, one of his better games. You have to remember he's coming off a torn ACL from last year, so still recovering and you know still trying to get his uh, you know his confidence in his legs under him a little bit. I think he has more to offer. He's going to get an opportunity now, and Green Bay really needs Deguara to step up. So I don't think they'll they'll really look outward too much. I think they're going to stick with the four that they have on the roster and see what they can do. But with the trade deadline coming up, you just never know, and we'll see if Brian Gutekunst gets creative. Those were the two pieces of bad news on the day, and then you had a very interesting piece of news. Darius Smith tweets out, back in Green Bay, he says, and can't wait to get back on the field with his teammates. He said he's, you know, somebody asked him about his back. He said he feels like a new man. Matt LaFleur didn't have any updates. He said he'd have some updates once he talks to the training staff and so on and so forth. But that, this has to be a positive, right? Like if Zedarius is back in Green Bay, if he's practicing, if he is, uh, you know, eventually practicing, excuse me, not practicing yet, but if he's wanting, you know, to, you know, to be back on the field and he's saying he feels like a new man, like those are positive, positive signs. And I've, I've been, you know, marinating on the idea, just so hoping that we get to see this Green Bay defense at full strength because they have been playing really good defensive football these past few weeks without guys like Zadarius Smith and Jair Alexander. Can you imagine if Rashawn Gary and Preston Smith can continue to play the way they are on the outside with Whitney Merciless spelling them on the outside, Z and Kenny Clark rushing from the inside on third downs, you know, Devondre Campbell as your primary linebacker, mixing and matching Chris Barnes and potentially Henry Black as a dime safety and so those sort of things with Jair Alexander in the star, Douglas and Stokes on the outside, Adrian Amos and Darnell Savage at safety. Those things have me salivating for what this defense could potentially become. Matt LaFleur has made mention of the fact that they're confident they're going to get Jair back at some point. Now Z is tweeting that he could potentially be back at some point. We will see. I think patience is key here. I, I think not getting your hopes up too far uh, is also key here, but that's a very positive. And if Zedarius can come back, like Rashawn has looked like a totally new rusher these past few weeks. Preston Smith is playing much better football than he did a season ago. We know how well Kenny's playing. Man, if Z can come back and be even remotely the player that he's been the last couple of seasons, what an insane boost to this defense. And you're looking at then this defense really having some high-end potential. I, like I said, it's hard to hold back the excitement. You know, try to, uh, you know, just temper it as much as possible. But 
that would be amazing if Zeke could come back and still have an impact on the season. Time will tell. A couple quick notes from Matt LaFleur's press conference. I asked him, first of all, about Kevin King, how close he was to playing, and then how they kind of figure out a corner rotation once all these corners are actually back. If you get Alexander and Stokes and uh, Kevin King and Razul Douglas and Chandon Sullivan, if they're all healthy, how do you kind of rotate these guys in? It was kind of an expected answer. I think the, the more important one is that he said Kevin King was really close, You know, basically paraphrasing, saying he was kind of close and um, that King really wanted to get on the field, was really pushing to play. It sounded like they, you know, short week, just kind of tempered things a little bit. And well, I mean, it sounds like he's probably going to be ready for Sunday against Kansas City. Uh, I know there's uh, mixed feelings about Kevin King, to put it lightly, but and it's going to be really interesting to see what role he has with Sullivan and Stokes and uh, Douglas playing as well as they are. But still, certainly, I mean, if any of those guys go out, you're up to Isaac Adam as your next guy. So regardless, depth is very important there. And it sounds like he was very close to playing. And then, you know, the kind of the canned answer from the LaFleur basically saying they're going to mix and match based on the opponent each week. Basically, it's going to be a competition. But we've heard in the past that they say, you know, Kevin King's a starter, that, you know, he's not going to lose his spot due to injury. Yeah, Matt LaFleur didn't say that. So we'll see what happens. But I think overall, it's still good news that King seems close to coming back. And then last but not least, Matt LaFleur addressed the timeouts and the, the clock management, owned it. I think that's one of the, the real great leadership traits that Matt LaFleur has, not being afraid to own different mistakes. And I, I, you know, one of the things that it does is it just puts things to rest. He's like, you know, I think when, when coaches try to deflect or you know, say anything else, then it, you know, it kind of can continue to bubble up and those questions can linger. But if he's, you know, if he just comes out and says, yeah, you know, I needed to be better in that situation. Didn't really fault Aaron Rodgers for any of the timeouts that he took uh, based on what happened on the field. I need to get players in better positions to succeed. Like he just owns that stuff. And, and whether that's coach speak or not, it still shows a level of leadership and just emotional IQ. Um, and I, you know, again, I can't be more impressed with how Matt Lafleur handles all of those sort of things. And I, I, I generally, genuinely trust him as well that he's going to work to get that stuff cleaned up and, and have it not be as much of an issue. Now, this has been going on for a very long time, even pre Matt Lafleur. So I get that it's probably not all on the floor, and I, th I think there's more at play here. I also asked him, you know, I said especially in the second half, you know, with timeouts being such finite resources and being such a huge part of end game scenarios. You know, do you want to rather just take a five yard penalty than wasting those timeouts? And he said that, you know, that absolutely plays a part in the equation, especially in second half of game. So, you know, he's well aware of the game theory in those situations. Uh, and I think those are going to be situations that they weigh out moving forward. And like I said, I genuinely trust him that they're going to have, you know, conversations about that and try to clean that up moving forward. That's going to do it for me today. Thank you for joining me. Uh, great, uh, great having you as always. Always appreciate you. I'll be right back here tomorrow with an all new episode. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.